Okay, at this time, any public comments with items not on the agenda? Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, um, the planning board would like to welcome our interim town planner, Betsy Ware. Welcome, Hi Betsy. Thank you. Um, an impressive resume. I look forward with working with you for the time. Well, I look forward to working with this board and um, as I said in a memo to you, I grew up in this town and um, my mother, I lived here um, on and off until um, my mother passed in 1995. So, um, great community, great place to grow up. And um, I'm looking forward to working with the board. Great. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we have a public hearing scheduled for 7. Before that, we have a few housekeeping things on the recodification. Uh, the number one thing, um, uh, Sarah, senior housing section vote to correct numbering error on 9.4. Um, I don't think we need to do that anymore, do we? No, that was brought up. At the yeah, last I think we're leaving at 9.6 in case the other things don't happen. Greg, isn't that correct? No, uh, no we, we no. do need to correct. So it was 9, it originally said 9.3, and we need to change that to 9.4. Uh, 9.4, okay. So the motion needs to say, we can try to figure out where it says 9.3. So the original motion, an article that you approved, oh. 9.3 as the new section. And it should say 9.4, which we have corrected on the materials, but you just need to make that formal vote to acknowledge that the yeah, original I'm original looking at the motion right 9. here. 4. It says 9.4. I think it was changed prior to change. before. Change. Well, changed. The we, have, we have to vote to do it, that's all. Okay. Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, sorry. Thank you. Somebody behind. make the motion. I make a motion that we change the uh, motion for Article 13 to add a new section 9.4 instead of 9.3. I'll second. Right. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Cerrone. Yes. Ms. Creighton. Yes. Ms. Foley. Yes. And Ms. Delicio. Yes. And chair votes yes, 7 0. Uh, 6 0, sorry. Um, any other housekeeping items before yep. we talk? Oh, two other housekeeping items, okay. or one housekeeping and one proposal. Um, we needed to send a, the planning board needs to send a report to the town moderator or the board of select, when I'm not sure, select board to just uh, indicate our. Um, work and so I put it at this I totally forgot about this we totally forgot about this so um, it is in your packet this afternoon but it's a compilation of the cricket article we approved last week and just the, the um, uh, exactly the front matter of each section here which is basically the open house material with uh, the edits that were errors like um, so that's, uh, there's really, it's just a procedural thing. So I'd like a motion to accept the planning board report. If you want, I can pull it up and share it, but it's in the folder. Are you Alan making that motion? Uh, I'll I'm make that second. motion. So I'll second the motion. Okay. Alan has his hand up. Okay, motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? Mr. Wilson, you have a comment? I was just gonna say this is a statutory requirement. Uh, under Chapter 40A, Section 5, and um, I've reviewed the report that Sarah drafted, uh, and it looks fine to me, satisfies the statute. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Any further discussion? Ms. Um, Poli. I did not see it in the packet. It didn't go till this afternoon. I can show it to you. I can pull it if you, if um, you want. And then my, my second point is, my understanding is the planning board was supposed to do a, a report before we handed it off to the select board. Is that correct? That I don't know. Uh, I, I can answer that. The, the statutory requirement is simply that it needs to be 
uh, reported in time to be available at town meeting. I don't think there's a requirement that it be submitted to the select board prior to that. Yeah, I mean, can you, is it in the folder now? It is in the folder now. Um, but I can, it's a top, uh, well, if you just do modified, it's, um, can we report to the town? <coughs> PDF. So I can read the front matter of the Manchester, it's basically what we approved for the cricket article. It's that we, and Laura edited with our support. Planning and board <coughs> has voted to present a number of changes to the zoning bylaws at the special town meeting. The board has been working on for more than three years. Is we're working on, you should say, them for more than three years. The select board voted to recommend all the articles. Here's a brief summary of the key proposed changes. Proposed changes clarify and update a number of provisions. They will strengthen and broaden a number of types of oversight. Moving, oh, sorry, I'm just the microphone here. Uh, moving certain provisions for junk cars, curb cuts, driveway entrance, and stormwater management for general bylaws where they have broader applicability, and reducing performance based requirements to bolster site plan review processes that's required for special permits. It provides for the new small housing accommodations, such as in-law apartments, to be created inside existing single-family homes. Such housing will be subject to greater regulations and allowed by right to meet certain criteria. The cap is set at 20 new housing units per year. All three, allowing the opportunity for senior housing facilities within Manchester, within neighborhood input, and rigorous site plan review by special permit. Four, allow certain changes to existing homes that do not comply with zoning, about two-thirds of the homes in Manchester, as long as setback and other dimensional requirements are met. Modify existing residential conservation bylaw to allow it in every district by special permit, including site plan review, and to eliminate the five acre parcel minimum. Strengthen and update our bylaws in align with the goals identified through significant town input collected in the master plan. The summary follows. And then I have, I just uh, took the, um, the uh, section, um, front matter for each section, and changed the font. Any further discussion? I'll take a roll call vote on uh, accepting the, the motion on the plan. Plan to examine. Uh, Ms. Delisio? No. Ms. Foley? Um, I, I'd like to review it, so I'm going to abstain right now. Uh, Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. And the chair votes yes, so it's 4 2, 4 1, and 1 abstention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other housekeeping items on recodification before I um, talk about this motions moving and seconding? I had one. So I don't know if you got my email. The, um, there's links on the town website for the proposed um, articles that go to old bylaws that we did like in April and May. So it was it's pre our um, modifications that we've been doing over the past few months so it's very confusing I've had different residents come up to me um, saying different things and I, I, I didn't know what they were talking about we were talking about swimming pools and they're saying you know that it's still going to the building inspector and I said no 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 we took that out and so I went to the website and they're just going to a different link um, so I'm concerned that residents aren't getting the actual articles. Well, I think the question would be, for, in terms of legal, would be the, the warrant goes to the right um, articles, and I checked that. The warrant articles aren't live. They're not what? Oh, you can't, you can't click, click on them. But you can copy it. I can't. I mean, I could type it. I mean, to be fair, there's a section on the recodification website that links to the correct articles. It just depends which link you're clicking on. Um, so why don't we remove the bad link that yeah. takes us to the old? Uh, we'll, we should talk to Tiffany in the, in the, in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a reason why the wired articles aren't live? They're blue. I don't know. I, we, we didn't do them. I mean, I don't have any conversation, so, I mean, that's... Out of my control. You and Chris are on the links to the um, to the Warren articles. Make sure I they become them. they I get live. When they were live. They have they haven't been live for me for the past couple weeks, but I don't think they've ever been live. 
Yeah. Well, the planning board website certainly has the correct one. Appears to have the correct one. The warrant articles. Yeah, but the, the, so and then it says motion for Article the Four. Planning board articles. On the so if you go to the um, the oh. town meeting link, and you go to this um, <clears throat> warrant articles, which actually. So these are not live. So if you try to link to these. Okay, so the links within the articles on the uh, document are not live. And then there's the other issue on the zoning recodification website. With so you would need to have to copy it and, and put it into your browser. The warrant is correct, though. All right, well, let's. Let's see if we can live get those live uh, tomorrow. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Any other? Uh, so, um, before we start the hearing, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the um, moving, seconding, and speaking on each motion responsibility. I thought about this. Um, and I've come up with the following uh, people to speak, and I, I can take comments from the board on this, but Articles 4 through 7, Sarah will move, and I will second. Article 8, I would have Chris move, and I would second. Article 9, Sarah, and I would second. Article 10 and 11, Chris, and I would second. Article 12, Sarah and I would second, and 13, 14, 15, and 16, Chris and I would second. Roger, Roger, could I ask you to just do that again? I will slowly? send you, I will email you this tonight. Um, and um, I have it, I have a, uh, I'll, I'll send you uh, an email with it. Could you just repeat them for me? Okay, let me repeat them. Four through seven, Sarah. Eight, Chris. Nine, Sarah. Ten, eleven, Chris. Twelve, Sarah. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, Chris. All seconded by me. Okay. Any may, further? Any more? Now may discussion? I ask why there was no discussion on that? Uh, I decided this would be the best best people to speak to get success on what we're proposing. Um, I think I chose the people that have done the most work and can speak on this. I think it's, it makes sense. Um, two board members to, uh, did not vote for the warrant, so I didn't think that would be germane. And then. Uh, one board member um, has been not showing up, so I thought these were the best people. Okay, fair enough. That was my thinking. Okay. I have one other zoning issue that I'd like to raise. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that we have a lot to do, at least tabs, and we've worked hard on this, but I have asked, and I know Alan would like to have this believes that this may not go, uh, get completed in one night. I'm hoping that he's wrong. Um, but I think it's in the town's, the voters' best interest that we work to have it be completed in one night, to the extent that we can with the moderators uh, allowing a discussion and so forth. So I'd like to make a motion that, um, that we authorize the chair to pass over motions after 10 p.m. to make a motion to pass over motions after 10 p.m. at the November 14th town meeting if he feels that it's in the best interest of the goals of the zoning recodification effort. So that's basically um, 
suggesting that Ron could make a decision, particularly as the meeting goes late, um, if we only have a couple things left, rather than bring people back for a second day, it would be up to him to say, you know, we'll, we'll move it off till spring. Not take them out of order, not do anything else, just move through them and then potentially pass, move to Passover in the interest of respect for people's time. So uh, I have a question about that. Does the second day uh, pose any risks or problems? Uh, why would we want to? Well, the second day, I think that I'll let Alan um, answer that. Let me, my thought is after 10 p.m. if we're only on, still on Article 4, and we would want to go to a second day to get important things done. I mean, Article 4. Hopefully, we'll be further along than that. But if the first three articles take a long time, we could be only at Article 6 or 8 at 10.30 PM. It's, un it's difficult to, to know where we'll be. The second day is so, all, the question is always whether you get a quorum. That's right. always the So first, then I guess maybe Alan. The first issue. Alan, yes, would Alan. you speak on the second day and possible issues? Well, there are, there are a number of issues. Um, I should mention that I have a letter that is now posted on the, on the town website to the voters and will be published in the Cricket on Friday, saying that um, my, my expectation is, given the warrant as it stands now, if we try to do all the articles, it, we will probably need two nights. And if so, if it becomes apparent that we'll need two nights, I don't intend to keep us late into the wee hours on Monday, but we'll adjourn at a reasonable time, or we'll propose to adjourn at a reasonable time, because it's subject to the voters' decision uh, to, to reconvene. There, there is the risk that we might not get a quorum for a second night, um, or, or that on the second night it might be a very different group of voters than we have for the first night. So it, it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, what the circumstances will be, but if it becomes obvious that we need two nights, I don't think we should try to press on until midnight or later uh, on the first night. I, mean, I think my hope is that we can get it done in one night. I, the issues seem to be, the policy issues seem to be matters of opinion rather than, um, so. People will state their opinions, and then the voters will decide. But so my proposal is that we authorize the chair to pass over motions after 10 p.m. on November 14th town meeting at November 14th town meeting, if he feels that it's in the best interest of the goals of the zoning reclassification effort. And give that's the only way, besides specifically targeting a particular article, that we can move to pass over. So it gives us the latitude, it gives Ron the latitude to decide to pass over something. Let, let me just MPM. interject for a moment. The, 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 you stated the, the motion, the, your motion correctly the first time. Uh, it, it got a little muddled the second time. It would authorize Ron to move to pass over. Right. The decision to pass over is ultimately in, in the hands of the meeting. Right. I guess I'm not clear. <laughs> um, are you are you saying for the planning board chair to to move to not go to the second night or to? I'm not understanding. So I'm thinking it's 11:30. People are drifting out, and we have one article left. Mm -hmm. Rather than bringing back people the next night, we might. Ron could make a decision as chair to push it off to, you know, whenever we decide, April or some other time. So, um, so we move to pass over, that we make a motion to pass over. And as Alan said, if the meeting wants to discuss it, then they would vote no to pass over. We would stay or take it up the next night. I just want to, I was just trying, I'm just trying to give us some flexibility because absent that, it's, it's my opinion that we as a board have voted to put them forward. 
and we have no public meeting to decide to pull them back. So therefore, we're committing to a sec to a second night if if the discussion goes long. We're committing to either stay late, you know, stay till they're done, or do a second night with a, without some provision to pass over that has been endorsed by us. Because otherwise, we've all voted. We have given to all voted. The board majority of the board has voted to push these things forward. So that's my that's my. I'm just trying to give us a little bit of flexibility. I trust that Ron has good judgment, and. So at 10 o'clock, you'll? No, after 10 o'clock, anytime after. So it just means that he can't decide it at 8 o'clock. <laughs> um, I'm trying to we're balance. close to the end. I'd like to you know, yeah. finish it up if Alan would allow it. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't think Alan wanted it to go past 10, right? Is that, is that the call? I, I didn't hear that. I thought I have heard you maybe at a board of selectmen meeting that you didn't want it to go past 10. Well, the reasoning I, I, start, the I started thinking about the time to adjourn at about 10. Uh, what I've said in my letter is that I, I don't intend to keep us to a, an unreasonable hour, and I'll, I'll try to adjourn by 10.30 if, at that point, it's obvious that we're going to need a second night. The, the decision is, a, is the voters, not mine. Um, but um, my experience over a very long time is that Anything we try to do past 11 becomes a real mess. People are cranky, they want to go home, they're tired, they will have been at it for more than four hours at that point. Um, it's, it's just not a good idea to be trying to decide on significant substantive issues much after 11 o'clock. So I, I, will, I will start thinking about whether it's appropriate to adjourn and move to a second night at about 10 depending on where we are. Chris. Can, can anyone move to pass over an article? Or is there, or does it have yes. To be? Well, no, but you're the first, you recognize the planning board for the main motion. Yes. And so if the main motion has been made, then Chris can't, if I've made the main motion for article 14, or whoever Chris is making it, I can't, then pass over that. No, you, you can't. And, and I, I won't. One, once early in my tenure, I allowed a motion to pass over as an amendment to a main motion to take affirmative action, and it was a disaster. And I promised myself I would never do it again. So once the main motion is made, um, it, it's, it's the, the motion to pass over is not in order. Um, I thought Chris was just asking a general question whether anybody could make a, a motion to pass over. You know? But I guess I guess my Ooh. my presumption is that Ron has listed who's going to list the motions, and the agreement on the part of the board is that that Chris and I would follow the board's voted recommendation to move these forward. I mean, it would yes. seem to be very much out of a bad a bad form for me to decide on my own to make a motion to pass over something. So essentially, what we're doing here is authorizing Ron. the chairman to act on our behalf. Right. To pass over some of the articles, if he deems it's in the best, in, if it's it. in the interest of the goals of the zoning recodification effort, I which I think we've been fairly clear about, clarity, updating, master plan. Okay. I can add those. So the goals of the master to provide clarity, to provide administrative updates, and to follow the recommendations of the master plan. I guess, I guess my only concern with that is because I trust Ron to do the right thing is that I'm wondering if it interferes kind of with the um, town meeting process in the sense that residents show up anticipating that we're going to go through all the articles, whether it's one night or two nights, and then it becomes the um, decision of the chair to, to not do that. So I'm wondering if we're we're shortchanging the residents in any way. Well, it's not his, not his decision. He's just making a motion. To right. clear off the and then it goes to a vote. Right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, it, it only happens by a vote of the meeting. So so I don't think you're shortchanging 
to voters at all. And I'll, I'll frankly be amazed if anyone is disappointed not to have a second night. Um, I would suggest two things. I don't see any reason to limit it to 10 p.m. Um, there's no real reason to do that. It might be appropriate at 9.30, I don't know. There's no reason to put a time limit in there. And it's also, is it, would you, we be giving you, um, I'm in favor of this, but maybe you might choose to uh, move, move uh, pass over 13 and 14 and jump to 15. So I think whatever motions you choose, you could, um, I would authorize you to make the motion to pass over whatever the, those are. Because between now and then, you may develop some ideas. And go ahead. Yep. I thought we just said that part of that motion was we wouldn't jump around. Yeah. Well, I think the jumping around to, could be that you would pass over, for example, eight U's, just as a for example, 15, and take up the two shorter ones of 15 and 16. As a for instance. So I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like then we might be cherry picking. So yeah, then, th then things seems like orchestrated behind the scenes and yeah. that makes me nervous. I, I mean your statement that we weren't gonna skip and move things around. Well I said I, not we're not gonna reorder them is my my recommendation. You know, you could so. I was anyway, okay with motion. until we heard that. Right, I've made a motion. So did the motion talk about taking things out of order? Because I'm not sure if I'm okay with that. I haven't thought about it long enough. And the motion is not, it does not anticipate one way or the other. It does not specify one way or the other. The motion is, I move that we authorize the chair to make a motion to pass over motions after 10 p.m. And the reason I said that is because that's the rough time when Alan says he's starting to think about whether we're going to go to it next night. At the November 14th town meeting, if he feels it's in the best interest of the goals of the zoning recodification effort. Well, I'll second it. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So a motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Can we add that we won't pass over? You can make that amendment if you'd like. Well, I was just trying to have a discussion. Yeah. If other people felt I about think it, I wasn't going to waste time if people were open. Yeah, my feeling that. is that I trust Ron and let's see how it goes. and. I guess that what you started out by saying is different than where we ended. So you yeah, said that right. we weren't going to skip over things, and now we did. So I said we weren't going to reorder things. Well, I think that's skipping over is reordering. The, it's not the same thing. I understand, I understand your point. I understand. I hear your point. I think we just. I'm just trying to give us some flexibility in getting this through this, you know, and not having one thing hanging over till the next night or three things or I don't know five things <laughs> no but I think it's the initial conversation was we're going to stop here because it's late and then we're going to move to the spring but now we're going to talk about which ones we think might go through right now and I think that's a different conversation the only thing I would say on that is that the town meeting has to vote and approve whatever you're doing so it's not like Ron is making a, a decision on behalf of Oh, he's going to make the motion to pass over 5, 6, 10, 13. And so if he does that, then if the town meeting votes to do it, that's fine. If they don't, then it's not going to pass. And we... I guess, but that's not the conversation we had in the beginning, is what my point is. Can, can, I, can I just interject and I think and perhaps answer Christina's question? The, the, there's a difference between passing over and reordering. Under our bylaws, we take up the articles in the order they appear in the warrant, unless the, mode, the meeting votes to take them in a different order. So reordering means after Article 5, someone moves to take up, instead of Article 6, Article 9. That's reordering. I think that's, Alan, thank you. But I think that's what happened at the end of the conversation. Sarah said that we're going to leave the judgment up to Ron to potentially skip over 10, 11, and 12, and jump to 13. So to me, that is reordering. It's well, it's not. It's, it's, it's keeping the same order, but it's passing over some that come next in order to get to those that come later. Okay. Okay, Same. motion's been made and seconded, and we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Alden? Yes. Right. Yes. Foley? No. Ms. Felicia? No. And I guess 
Do I have a vote? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, it's uh, four two. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're a little behind now. Um, Okay, well, before I open the public hearing, uh, just for um, the audience, um, just to respect all participants, whether you disagree or not, no negative innuendos or attacks, please keep your remarks focused on specific topics, and please refrain from repeating questions. So the process will be, I'll open the hearing, we'll hear from the applicant, we'll hear from the board, we'll hear from the public, We'll deliberate. I'll get a sense from the board whether they want to vote tonight or on this, uh, or a need for a continuous uh, continuance. Um, if not, I'll close the public hearing and make a motion to vote. After that, we'll have someone write the decision. But I think Betsy, you volunteer to do that. Thank you. Okay. This time I'd like to open the public hearing on a special permit application for a site plan approval for Crocker's Boatyard. Public hearing you notice has been duly and advertised in the cricket as follows. In accordance with MGL Chapter 40A, Section 11, the Manchester by the Sea Planning Board will hold a public hearing on November 9th at 7 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting with public participation via Zoom to consider the application of Crocker's Boatyard to install and reconfigure floating docks and to create a marina reconfiguration zone at their facility located in Manchester Harbor. This, this is in accordance with section 7.5 and 4.1.10J of the zoning bylaw. This is to add additional slip areas to the existing docks extending towards the harbor channel. The board has received responses from the police chief, harbor master, and the CONCOM were all made part of this record. No, no, for, no responses have been received from any of the other boards. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Susan St. Pierre on behalf of the applicant for Crocker's Boat Yard. Thank you, Chair. Also, Skip Crocker is here with us tonight. And Skip, Skip welcome. Thank you. Um, so, as most of you are aware, what we're proposing is an extension to the existing floating dock system located at Crocker's Boat Yard. And the proposal is to extend the system southerly into Manchester Harbor. Um, we reviewed the layout with the Harbor Master uh, throughout the whole process, and he's in support of the project. Um, we appeared before the Manchester Conservation Commission and received an order of conditions uh, in September. Um, additional permits that we'll need to get is for this particular project, uh, we filed a NEPA environmental notification form when we did the first phase a couple of years ago. Included in that first phase was a configuration of the second phase that was later dropped during the local approval process. So because of that change, we have to go back to NEPA with the notice of project change. So in addition to the note, and we didn't want to do that until we finished the planning board process. So in addition to the uh, MEPA filing, we need a Chapter 91 license for the placement of structures in tidal waters and then up the Commonwealth. And then we also need a Army Corps Section 10 permit for the placement of structures in navigable waters of the United States. So basically the components of the project, uh, we're proposing 10 finger floats Six on the westerly side, this is a main float coming down. So there are six finger floats off the west side and then four off the east side. And then we have a terminal float proposed at the end. Then we also have some, some larger areas of, of docks that will be used by the um, dock master and for storing equipment and things of that nature. So the proposed floating docks will be held in place by 16 new 12 inch uh, steel pipe piles. Um, Let's see. So, in terms of impacts, uh, putting a marina in a harbor that's recently been dredged is an appropriate use. Um, we've, orient we've skewed the orientation, as you can see. It doesn't go straight out from the existing floating dock because we need to maintain 25-foot setback from the projected riparian 
property lines and adjacent property owners. Um, we are set back 20 feet from a proposed future 70 foot wide channel. They'll be created once the Crocker Boyette and, and Manchester Marine, which is the next hearing, are working together with the Howard Master to create this channel. There's no impact on water and sewer infrastructure. Um, the board uh, asked questions about um, parking spaces and traffic at the site visit, so the project will require six and a half parking spaces, and those will either be provided at the Crocker Lower Boat Yard, where the yard is, or they have um, two lots off of High Street, where there's plenty of parking. And then, um, according to the uh, ITE Transportation Manual, the, the marina will generate 48 trips per day, but what's important is that that's only 1.4 trips in the AM peak hour, in each AM peak hour, and 4.2 trips in the PM peak hour. So it's a small amount of traffic. Um, the board also asked us to touch on public benefits of the project when we're at the site visit. So we've, we've outlined those in the memo that we sent uh, last week, but I'll just review them now. So again, the, the project is going to be utilizing the public investment that the town made in bridging the harbor back in 2017, 2018. It's gonna be improving navigation because once you see the other project, it's gonna create sort of a, a line of the navigation channel which is gonna help anybody navigating into Manchester Harbor, even people that are using the harbor or visitors coming to the harbor. Um, investing in, in, in the Floating dock system improves the economic viability of this important local business in Manchester. Uh, the existing uh, marina plus the proposed marina will generate $25,000 annually in harbor use and dredging assessment fees. The proposed extension of that is $6,800 a year. Um, the property generates $22,000 in real estate taxes. It has 16 to 22 jobs, 16 right now, but they need 22. Um, the boats that grow up at the facility uh, are required to pay excise, state excise tax, taxes. Half of that goes to the town. Um, there are secondary uh, economic impacts from the project to other town businesses. People go get something to eat, they go buy paint, they go do whatever they do when they're boating. Um, and also it addresses the demand for slip space. As the harbor master mentioned, there's a very long waiting list for mooring spaces, and there's also a very long list for slip spaces. Uh, Parker Boat has, yeah, has a wait list of 60. And then lastly, I'd just like to say that it preserves a, a business that has a rich, as part of the rich maritime history of the town. So those are the public benefits um, that we addressed in our original filing and how the project meets all the um, criteria for the planning board to issue a special permit. And so we hope that you could do that. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? Go around. Christina. Um, I guess for my first question, um, you said no impact on water and sewer infrastructure. Um, what would be the increase of demand of water um, with the additional, I mean, there's washing and maintenance of boats. So has that been looked at? Sleepiness or that? I mean, we won't be storing any more boats than we typically do now. Um, let's say there's a minimal number of people that wash their boats on a regular basis. Um, obviously, nobody washed them this summer because there's a water ban. I think we use, uh, we were using on water use, but I would say it's a minimal impact on water use. And this is, I haven't read all the Water Resource Committee's reports, but I both thought I read or heard that between you and Manchester Marine, that you guys were one of the top seasonally of water consumers. Is that false? I wouldn't think so. Okay. I, I'd like, that's uh, why I'd like, I, don't know. I thought I heard that one meeting passing. So I guess with the increase of boats, I would just assume that you would use water to, at the end of the season to close them up, store them. And, we power wash boats, right. but I mean that's, when we have a wash water tank that we collect water in the, we don't recycle, we pump it, we have it pumped out. Uh, we, that's, we 
2,000 gallons. We empty that three or four times a year. Okay, do you actually bring the water in or do you use town water? I'm just, no, we use town water. Okay. But we have to collect the wash water when we power wash mm -hmm. the boats. It's probably the most, when we power wash probably 250 boats in the fall. And that water, as much of it we can, we have to collect. And then we have it pumped and transported off site for mm -hmm. processing. I think, I think for the year, I think it's about 3,000 gallons each time. And I think we empty that four times a year. That's probably, that's like 12,000 gallons. And then we don't fill water tanks anymore because no one uses the water in the boats and it all goes stagnant in the tank. So they might fill it at the yacht club, they might fill it somewhere else. During this, most of the boats in my marina are small. I guess then my just large overarching question for both projects is, um, and maybe this is more to buy on and anyone else who's on the Harbor Advisory Committee or anyone on the select board that's here, where are we at on a Harbor plan? So I guess that's... Is, that, is there talk? Is there discussion? Is that a one year, two year? Is it done? I just where are we at on a harbor plan? So currently, the harbor plan, uh, we have a request for a proposal to the Urban Harbors Institute. Um, a harbor master plan will take a year to two years to do a proper comprehensive plan. So. There's been no money appropriated for one yet. There hasn't been a vote to uh, actually do a harbor plan yet. Uh, it's so the very beginning stages, and uh, I would expect it to be some time before there's a harbor master plan in place. Brad, you have a comment? Uh, yes, Ron, I can just elaborate a little bit more. So the, the select board has uh, discussed um, creating a harbor master plan, they are in favor of doing that, and they will be working to get that underway um, and would anticipate um, getting it underway probably in the wintertime with welcome uh, participation from the planning board um, on that uh, committee or task force to undertake uh, the creation of the master harbor master plan um, and would anticipate um, some seed money coming from professional services line that the select board has and would supplement that uh, at town meeting in, in the spring. So we anticipate it getting underway um, sometime next year. Great, thank you. Sorry, comments? Um, one question is, have we heard anything from the Har Harbor Advisory Committee? Have they been asked for their input? The Harbor Advisory Committee uh, scheduled a meeting for this evening at 5 o'clock, and uh, the topic of a Harbor Master Plan uh, was on the agenda, but due to technical difficulties, that meeting will be moved to next Wednesday. Do you know if, I mean, have they discussed these um, expansion plans or have an opinion? Uh, it has been discussed. Um, they have not voted uh, any on on the topic, uh, so I I don't have any recommendation one way or the other from them for anybody. So I mean, for from my viewpoint, it might be nice to invite them to the planning board and get their take on on this plan. Um, I guess at this point, I just have one clarifying. Um, on the memo that you sent, you gave the total harbor use fee. Did you say these additional moorings would be 6000 a year? Oh, yeah, some of these numbers have been corrected. So the total combined is 25000 OK. And then the yeah, 18500 is existing. And then 6800 is proposed. The proposal. Would generate 6,800. 6,800. Okay. Is there a walk through? I thought you were you gonna put something together for us. Did I miss that? Yeah, it was in our packets. It is. What is it called? A um, 
It's a memorandum. I just looked for it too, and I, I'm sorry, I just didn't see it. Could we get those updated numbers at some point? Yes. Um, Additional information in a minute. Yes. Thanks. That's all right now. Thanks. Um, the where the new finger slips are going, are they replacing any existing moorings, or is it just all new? Are there just um, regular moorings in those areas? Is there a net, you know, gain? Uh, Skip, I think in your case. We, 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 we reorganized that cove in Bayan's direction. There was plenty of room in the cove. We just tightened up the mooring field, and everything on that mooring, we find through in on this. Everything in that mooring field is bow and stern, and we just put everything in a line so it's a more efficient use of the space. And currently, where we're proposing putting the docks, there is nothing in the way except for main streams that one what we call pony dock. Um, and that's going to be relocated in their project. That, so it's going to be 20 new. Best. Right, but I mean, if there was Not three or four there, it would be 17, but you know, that's, that's what 20 I was saying. No. It's 20. So we, haven't, we haven't eliminated any okay. more space. All right, that was my question. Yeah. All the moorings that were in the cove are still in the cove, they're just yeah. location. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's uh, Sarah. Um, you mentioned that you had filed with NEPA for the. Uh, when you did the phase one that you um, also phase two was included in your MEPA filing, but you have to modify Eight, that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. At that point, it was just a, a single main float extending out to the harbor. Didn't have finger floats on it. And was that uh, denied or, or modified um, on your special permit, in your special permit we application? Not, we, we, we dropped did. that design when we went before the local boards because he wasn't sure if there was going to be, he just wasn't sure how much money he had on this. Yeah. So, so because it was included in the meet filing, we have to go back and. Right. Okay. I guess my concern is in general, you know, incrementalism is problematic, at least from a permitting, conceptual permitting process. Um, I, did, I did confer with NEPA on, it, on this, and they suggested an OPSI project change. Okay, and NEPA mm -hmm. has a public comment process. Yes, NEPA has a well, uh, yeah for the notice of project change. I believe it's anyone who commented on the project or who received copies of the ENF that okay. will receive a copy of the notice of project change. We dialed it back. I don't remember if it was this board or conservation commission thought the project was too big for them at the time to understand, so we cut it back to a small project at the request of the town of Manchester. I don't know if planning board of conservation. What year was that? Do you know? When did you, uh, when? I'm just yeah, three years ago. I think it was cut back before it came to the planning board. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question is the uh, navig um, issues around navigation, maybe a question for Byron. Um, once you get uh, some boats out there on the end of that dock, mm -hmm. uh, little boats zooming around. Um, and you have a big, you know, 50-foot boat going into Manchester Marine, uh, do we still have the maximum depth available in what's the channel? And do you see that there's uh, congestion? You know, traffic is our jurisdiction. We don't usually think about boat traffic, but it's a, it's a busy, on a hot summer day, it's a busy place, and it's a, um, it's my experience is that it's a, can be quite narrow and so forth. So, Brian, I guess I'd like to know if you think there's any detrimental impact on the uh, traffic at the at its peak times. Sure. So, uh, weekend days, weekend afternoons, uh, when boats coming back in particular, uh, what we don't see uh, from uh, boaters in this harbor is everybody uh, leaving at once or. Uh, getting back at the same time, unless, of course, we're talking about the fireworks um, on the 3rd and 4th of July. Uh, I, I actually feel as though if the cove over there right now has more room uh, for boats to safely stand by and wait to join um, boats departing or 
entering the harbor uh, than there was uh, before with the moorings overwhelming that, that particular cove. So I don't see any detrimental navigational effects, even on a busy day. Questions? I sort of feel like a duck out of water asking about questions about the harbor. Um, I do support the idea of a master plan for the harbor. I think that's a great idea. I don't think these projects would affect it. No, I'm sorry, the master plan would affect these projects necessarily. Um, so I don't have any questions at this point. Okay, thank you, Chris. Mr. Gilbert, anything? How um, have the selectmen um, offered an opinion on this? Most of the board of selectmen is meeting. Um, they asked a lot of questions. Buying uh, talked a lot of the meeting. They didn't take a vote. They said that they would pass their comments on. And that's what they said. So they don't. In, they, they didn't take a vote. They don't intend to take a vote. Unclear what the I'm not, I'm not clear what the process okay. is, but I, I didn't realize that we had to go to the board. Um, uh, just wondering if they offered an opinion. Greg, 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 do you have a response to the SB? Uh, sure, I just elaborate a little bit. So, so yes, the board um, did did have the uh, the applicants in and did have a discussion. Um, they felt that uh, they didn't have any particularly um, um, important input to provide. They um, they were focused on you know, sort of public public good versus private good. Um, noted a number of the, uh, the benefits of the projects uh, versus the one concern of taking up obviously using some um, ocean bottom land, but um, did not feel that things rose to, to the point of needing a major comment or vote for you as a board. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd be curious to hear if um, the harbor master has any general comments to offer. Do you have an opinion or opinion? It was oh, right. So, um, right. Um, and are we? I wonder how the board feels. To, I don't think we need to ask the harbor advisory committee to come in, but how does the board feel about maybe asking them to s submit an opinion? We could. Be just in writing, it's send us a memo before we vote. Could we possibly get copies of the correspondence, various correspondence from, from different? You said you got something from the Harbor Master and the Constitution. Yes, I can get you a, a copy of the Harbor Master's opinion. Yeah. Any correspondence that you get from other board meetings? That's all right. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'll open uh, this up to the public uh, right now. Um, anybody from the public have any comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Starkey. You're on yes. mute. Uh, okay. Um, Could you give us your start. name? Can you just uh, state your name and address? Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Starkey. I'm at 13 Tux Point Road. Um, <coughs> I have been a, I've had a sailboat in the harbor for 40 years. I live on the harbor. I'm a past chairman of the Harbor Advisory Committee and a past chairman of the Dredging Advisory Committee. And I wrote the harbor bylaw that was passed by a town meeting about 10 years ago. I've had a long and deep involvement in the harbor. The thing that is very different from this these proposals than almost anything else that you do is that the applicants do not own the land on which they propose to build. They don't own the land. The town does not own the land. The state does not own the land. The land is owned by the people and by the public trust doctrine, which has been part of common law for about 2,500 years, and was codified in the colonial ordinances of 1641 to 1647. The ocean and the ocean bottom are a public trust uh, for the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Chapter 91 of the Massachusetts General Laws cover 
what is done uh, codifies the what the public trust is here, and it also designates the DEP as the agent agency responsible. Chapter 91, Section 18, which I hope you are all familiar with in depth, says outlines the licensure requirements for public title lands, which we are talking here. These are public title lands. That the planning board must be notified prior to a filing for a DEP uh, chapter 91 license. If the planning board may hold a public hearing advising the DEP. I'm not sure this is that meeting or not. Um, but it also outlines the decision making criteria are absolutely explicit. The project must have a quote proper public purpose and must not be detrimental to the public's rights to these title lands. That is critical. That is what your job is to determine if there's a proper public purpose to these projects and whether or not they are detrimental to the public's rights to use title lands. Okay. What does this have to do with boat yards? It has a lot to do with boat yards. Boat yards have a very important public function. They maintain boats, they repair boats, they store boats, they commission them in the spring, they take them apart in the fall. That's very good. No one has any issue with, with boat yards. Uh, and boat yards need moorings, they need floats to manage boats that they're working on. That's fine. And if they use those, uh, those moorings and uh, the the floats, you know, to store other people's boats during the season, that's fine too. You know, we can inject that. But we're not talking about boat yards here, we're talking about marinas. Marinas are a completely different beast. They happen to be owned by the boat yards, but they have completely different economics and, and different legal basis. Um, for example, the DEP establishes very clearly what the public's interest in, in Hand, handing out mooring permits. Um, in specific, mooring permits by, by DEP regulations in Chapter 91, mooring permits must be assigned fairly from a public and transparent waiting list uh, that there may be no discrimination of, uh, by, res by residency for applicants, that there is a cap on what can be charged for a mooring fee, and that no mooring permit can be revoked without proper due process, including the right of appeal to the DEP. A marina, in essence, is a way to jump the waiting list. If you're willing to spend ten to $15,000 a year, you don't have to wait on the waiting list. This is not in the public interest. Um, the marina offered none of these protections to, to their customers. Their customers on a year-by-year -year basis, they can kick them out if they don't like them, uh, and they have no recourse whatsoever. So there is not, do not conflate a slip in a marina with a completely awarded mooring permit. Uh, both yards have been accorded moorings uh, in the past for, for overflow from, from their floats when they're working on boats, when they're waiting for parts. Um, and they, they have rented these out for transients. This is completely appropriate and, and normal. And, but you know, in the past, uh, about seven or eight years ago, it was discovered that Manchester Marine was in fact renting out their moraines by the season. Um, again, so people can pay five or $10,000 not to have to be on the waiting list and go right to the front. The, the town, both the Harbor Advisory Committee and then formerly by the Board of Selectmen, amended the rules, the harbor, the harbor uh, mooring rules, to say that this is not permissible, that no one can use a mooring, a boat yard mooring for more than two weeks in, in a year. And that's, that's just a clear example of what is meant by the public interest. A boat yard has a right to have some moorings, to have floats, and they can rent those, the floats out but they cannot use this to jump the mooring list. So the question really revolves around whether, not whether the existing moorings will be displaced. Of course, they can't be because we wouldn't cancel the mooring permit anyway. Um, but whether the projects will prevent the public from getting new mooring permits. And it's absolutely true. We have a harbor that's been maxed out for 45 years. And if you take a large hunk of the harbor and you turn it over to a private entity, 
to turn it into slips, yes, there are going to be people who will not be able to get warrants because we have given that public land to a private entity for private slips. So this is clearly detrimental to the public's right to use these tidal lands. There is no question whatsoever that now that we have instituted um, floating, shared floating piers or uh, floats for tying boats up, that we could put exactly the same boats on public moorings that would be otherwise slips in a private marina. So there is no question whatsoever about the number of boats in the harbor. Not. It is sophistry to say that you can take a hunk of the harbor bottom, give it to a private entity, and that will not have an effect on the public. That's just plain false. So neither of these projects has a proper public purpose as defined by Chapter 91, Section 18. That is the essence of the question. If you do not find that they have a public purpose, and addition tax revenue is not a proper public purpose, then, and if you find that this is detrimental to the public's right to use tidal land, then you really have to turn this down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Starkey. Any other public comment? Can I ask them a question? Uh, you have a comment? I have a question for Mr. Starkey. Yes. Are you suggesting uh, that this would displace the possibility of um, the number of public moorings increasing? Uh, let me find my. Okay, I guess I'm not muted. Um, of course, there will be more moorings there if we don't do this. Of course, there will. Um, you're just, there's no question at all. If you're going to use additional space for moorings, and I would also point out that the boat, two boat yards want to use not only public tide lands, but public tide lands that were dredged at town and state expense for which they did not contribute a nickel. So I have to ask about what are effects for getting state funding for our next dredging project, which is going to be over $3 million, when we've taken a third of what they paid to dredge last time, and rather than making it available to the public, We've walled it off and given it to private organizations who can charge with the market will so people don't have to sit on a waiting list. Any uh, additional comments to Mr. Starkey? Okay. I actually have a question. Um, Mr. Starkey, could you, um, what was the name of the document that you said that you created? The Harbor Bylaw. The Harbor, Harbor Bylaw. Yes. Uh, the Harbor Bylaw uh, establishes that the mooring and waiting lists have to be public. They have to be posted in town hall. They have to be posted on the website. Uh, and that the Harbor Master is a full time position between April and October, um, during which the Harbor Master can now hold any other town position. Uh, we did have a big problem with moorings that for three years, the nobody got a mooring off of the waiting list, but the number of moorings in the harbor didn't go down. Um, this addressed that, and it also opened the possibility for bringing Bion into town. So the, the, it was actually rather interesting. The harbor bylaw didn't come up to about for debate until 11.15 at night, uh, Alan uh, kind of made a bad call on whether we were going to go two nights or not. It was hotly debated for about uh, half an hour, and it was passed um, overwhelmingly about two-thirds on the voice vote um, at, at quarter to midnight. And so the town is very much behind proper public administration of the harbor. So. Um, I'm asking myself if there's a difference between these two proposals. I mean, they are two proposals, but we are thinking of them as um, uh, kind of collectively, but particularly with uh, the navigation um, issues. I just. Um, I can see that the Crocker's float um, doesn't 
interfere with navigation to the extent that the Manchester Marine one, and we're not talking about the Manchester Marine one right now, but I just um, pose in your heads whether they have the same public benefit or detriment. Um, the other thing is, I think Jim makes an interesting argument, but I think there's a flip side to that argument, which is if someone is on the waiting list and can get a slip, then the waiting list moves up one notch. And, and somebody who's below the person who gets the, who's willing to pay for the slip moves to a higher, a, a closer, closer to having a warrant. So, um, and I guess then the last question is, is there any public access to either of these, well, let's, we're talking about crockers, the crockers um, pier, proposed pier that were, um, is there any public access to the pub, to the to the pier? Um, we're not proposing any. You mean coming down all the floating docks? Whatever. Any any public access? In, no. <clears throat> not proposed as part of the phase two, the phase one. Uh, DEP required um, the boat yard to post signs and allow public passage, which is the requirement of Chapter ninety one. Between, um, what does the sign say? It's high and low. Between high and low. To walk along the water. Yeah, that's different. This is not high or low. It's not, so if you, let me just give an example. If you're proposing a pier off the property, you have to make sure that that pier is high enough so that if somebody's walking along the shoreline, yeah. that there's enough clearance above high water so that they can walk in. Uh, public public access uh, often is required for non. It's always required for non-water dependent projects proposed on filled or floating guidelines. So the regulations require access to and along the waterfront for non-water dependent projects. These two projects are both water dependent projects. I, I also want to point out that DEP Division of Waterways implement section 18 of the chapter 91 law and when they look at chapter 91 license applications they consider public benefit public de detriment public good and all that in their deliberations but before they issue a license they have to make those findings so uh, i'm having trouble understanding what it is we're supposed to be doing here uh, it seems to me that Mr. Starkey may raise some very interesting points. I'm not sure that's our call here. We're not, is that the DEP that issues the permit, not us? Yeah, and we're just advising the DEP as to what the town <coughs> the, the, the You have to give a special permit. The zoning bylaw that was, I don't know when it was adopted, it's the only one I've ever encountered. The Chapter 91 regulations, mm -hmm. when, you, when you prepare a Chapter 91 license application, you're required to submit a copy to the planning board who, as Mr. Starkey said, can either just receive the license application and not comment on it, or they can comment on it, or they can hold a public hearing. It's at your discretion what you want to do with that. In this case, in this case, your a bylaw was adopted. Usually it just goes to the plan, the plan board or whoever represents the town plan. In this case, you adopted a bylaw that said any project subject to Chapter 91 license must come before the planning board and get a special permit. Okay, got it. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Bayon, in I think our conversation at the site walk, you had mentioned that we're actually, that you're reducing the amount of moorings through attrition, which is contrary to what Mr. Starkey just said, that if these were not a public dock, then we would most obviously have more moorings. So could you touch on that? I have reduced the number of moorings in the harbor because the uh, harbor is uh, too congested with uh, the majority of the moorings being short scoped. That means the chain is too short um, for what would be considered a uh, mooring uh, tackle standard. Uh, so in order to, rather than uh, continue to 
put votes on warrants that have been surrendered or uh, taken away for failure to use, failure to pay, uh, I would just not um, reassign those warrants. Um, it is outside the norm for uh, most New England harbors where the idea is that you just uh, uh, keep packing the boats in, but uh, it's, it's inappropriate. Um, the harbor, well, the number of people that ask, why do we have uh, fenders hanging off all our boats and what's with the laundry baskets? That's because of uh, property damage caused by boats that are, are overlapped and they're swinging to, to such an extreme degree. So uh, the moorings have been reduced in the harbor, everywhere in the harbor, every part of the harbor uh, by attrition. And we will continue to do that until we have appropriate spacing for all vessels. As far as the code goes, uh, no moorings were uh, taken away for anybody's projects. Uh, I don't do that. I didn't do it in Kittery. Uh, I will, will never do it as long as I'm a harbor master. Uh, nobody's, whether it's a private dock uh, for a property owner or a commercial facility, uh, warrant holders uh, rights are sacrosanct. We're not going to allow those to be taken away for anybody. Um, two other questions. Um, by, given that you've just sort of made the case that the harbor is extremely congested, yeah. how does that square with adding um, 40 more boats or whatever the total number is, X rockers plus Manchester Marine. Um, that's the first question. And then I have a follow up question. Right. So, uh, uh, as far as the congestion goes, congestion, uh, as far as moorings go, is something that we can address. We can actually take steps to reduce uh, the number of moored boats that are um, causing property damage to each other and eventually uh, be able to allow uh, more uh, appropriate uh, mooring tackle for boats so that when there's a storm or bad weather, uh, boats can have uh, the appropriate amount of chain. That's different than the congestion that we see from uh, boats coming in uh, to our harbor every weekend, Long Beach, or, or any part of the harbor. Um, and again, if, if all of our boaters were to leave the harbor and come back in the harbor at the same time, that would be incredibly impactful. And, you know, well, we need so further I think that's important. Um, I think last summer we were, it was like a sudden squall, and everybody did come back into the harbor at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, that, that's that, absolutely that's, yeah, that's yeah. the eventuality that, okay, the second question is, um, for Skip and I guess well for you, um, do you, you have public bathroom facilities for your uh, slip uh, slip owners? Yes. Manchester Marine picked up. Yes. Okay. My um, and then is there ever a does any of the Chapter ninety one or special permit um, uh, conditions ever require? the enforcement or a reminder of these uh, vessels that they keep their um, holding tank active rather than discharging into the... That's like a stay and settle. I know, but the, maybe we could, could... One condition I think I'd be interested in is having a sign that reminds people that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think people are... We're pretty adamant about keeping those things functioning because we don't want to work at all. <laughs> right, but yeah. I so, think it... Yeah, signs are easy. That's fine. Signs are easy. Um, okay. okay, any uh, any other member of the public would like to speak? Right. Uh, thank you, Ron. I just, I guess a, a, a clarification question to buy on, if I, if I might. Um, you know, Jim, Jim Saki's comments were, were, were very helpful and, and informative, um, but it's 
my understanding that if, if the marinas are, are to exist at all, expansion or no expansion, that we would not be putting moorings, additional moorings, where these floats are being proposed. Is that correct, Bob? Right, so that, that area of the harbor was already terribly congested. Uh, first step taken was to uh, convert those moorings to bow and stern. And uh, then the final step was to appropriately align them, which would be wonderful to do throughout the entire harbor, but uh, to align them so that uh, the boats don't take up more room than they need to in the harbor. We, we don't need the, the boats on moorings to take up more space uh, than they need. Um, I have no intention of assigning any more moorings, new additional moorings in, in the harbor until all of the uh, swing issues are addressed, uh, scope issues addressed. Uh, if we can get those done, then I would absolutely 100% advocate, uh, if spacing was appropriate, to reintroducing uh, those moorings that have gone away due to attrition. So there's no reason that, uh, to think that eventually, through a harbor master plan, through thoughtful process, uh, that we could not one day increase those numbers. But there are steps that have to be taken first. I don't, I don't know if that hit the mark or not. Well, again, I was really focusing on this, the areas right in front of both marinas. Right, right. So. Right, so those were already heavy, heavily trafficked areas um, and, and lots of boats coming in and out, particularly in the spring and fall to those two facilities as boats are being launched uh, and hauled. And uh, it was challenging to uh, get boats in and out of those facilities. And I would say, uh, if we look at that area now, that issue has been corrected. Uh, we've created ample, appropriate navigational space for vessels to get in and out of uh, those facilities for the service and work that needs to be done. And uh, also, uh, obviously, the boats going in and out of the slips. On the sidewalk, we talked about baffle walls or something? Is that? Um... Uh, I'm sorry? Did we talk about some kind of baffles being put in on that side uh, during the sidewalk, or, was, or I was, was I mistaken? Baffles, no. no. The bound stern moorings that uh, we, we put in, uh, the, converted those uh, moorings to, and then the realignment. That was the, that was the necessary thing to do that now, that part of the harbor right now is probably one of the, the easier ones to get in and out of uh, as far as moorings go. Well, okay. I have one more question. Yeah, Mary Foley. Um, you brushed over the parking. Could we get a clear understanding of the, because um, it's, you know, you, you'd need additional parking for what, 20 to 25? Cars, 20 mm -hmm. cars. Six and a half parking spaces. For 20 slips? Yeah. There, oh. are st there are national standards, and there's a standard of so many parking spaces per slip, and the that equation results in six and a half parking spaces for 20 slips. When you take the boats out and put them in the water, you have the storage where the boats were. Yeah, for parking. yeah and I'm just going back to the new... Um, from town planners notes <laughs> that I, I just don't want it brushed over knowing that we have a parking issue downtown that you know for those times where there's still boats in storage and you know people need parking mm -hmm. is it on site you mentioned something on bridge street some other sites on bridge street i guess Water. just trying to understand if, if there's clearly parking when needed so if the boats are still in storage people aren't parking we use the slips because the boats are still in there so as the boats get launched, it opens up more and more parking. Currently, in my lower yard, we have capacity to store, I'm going to say 20 boats, and they're all roughly, I think the smallest one down is probably 32 feet. 
So which is standard car. You park twenty sailboats, power boats down there, they're thirty feet long. Plenty of room for parking. I think you can get uh, twenty five cars down there on a Saturday. And then the upper yard's almost an acre and we get about 50, 60 boats in there ranging in size from 26 to 40, 42, 24. So, you know, we're talking, if I rented all my slips, that would be 66 slips. If I can park 100 boats, 26 feet or greater on the property, this would be the deal for 66 cars. Keep in mind during the winter when those, all the boats are hauled out, we still have anywhere from 15 to 20 employees parked in there every day. Everybody drives their own car. I'll call it 15, I guess five of them has are in Essex. And there's parking, there's a small parking lot behind my father's house at 7 Ashton Avenue, which I have an easement over, and I think there's parking for 10 cars there. Maybe eight, including his. So and what happens in April is we empty the lower yard we have parking down there on weekends. So by May 1, the lower yard is typically empty, maybe one or two stragglers. So there's parking during the week down there and during the weekends. And then the parking behind my father's house is reserved parking there during the week. And on the weekends, that's open. And as the boats get launched, there's more parking, more people use them. We take all the trailers. Trailer boats all go to Essex. There's no trailer store there. We clean the yard. We move. The, we put the equipment away inside and ex maximize the parking as much as we possibly can. Thank you. So, um, I know there was some talk about getting an opinion from the Harbor uh, Committee. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to continue or we could move towards a vote tonight. Uh, just try to get a sense of the board. Can I ask? Yeah. Betsy Ware, you said, suggested that we might want to continue the hearing. Can you explain why? Um, as the person who writes the decision, I usually don't like the board to write, uh, to vote on it the night of the hearing. Um, I don't believe the world is in that much of a rush. Um, my preference, is, and this has consistently been my preference for 30 years of land planning, is that the board waits um, to the next meeting or the following meeting um, where they have a detailed decision in front of them. And the applicant has a detailed decision in front of them, and you hash out the decision. So it's I'm much cleaner. It's a legal document that gets filed at the Registry of Deeds. And um, given some of the idiosyncrasies and, um, you know, kind of shape shifting of various elements of the project, whether it's this project or any project, it, it just, there's no need to, to take a vote on the night of the hearing. So I, I just support what you're saying. Is there any other information you want? Does the board feel they want to get an opinion from the Harbor Advisor? Uh, well, we, 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 we kind of asked for yeah. an opinion from the Harbor Committee. Uh, well, I just wanted to say, I find this approach is very refreshing. Thank you. Um, but I, I think my understanding is only three people on the Harbor Advisory Committee. Is that true? I don't know. Do uh, we know how many are on the Harbor? Did you, did Three, there's, there's actually seven okay. uh, members. I just, um, just as we are a board, people have differing opinions. So um, I would like to hear all the concerns, not just one letter. So I thought there was three, so my, my add on that, but um, maybe they could come versus a letter. Well, are, is the, are they predisposed to offer an opinion on this? Uh, I do not know. Um, certainly, I'll be uh, addressing this with them, uh, bringing up the issue next Wednesday at their uh, rescheduled meeting. Do you know, Rob? I, I can't offer an opinion for them. I, I don't know. All right. In lieu of what I've heard, I think we might want to just continue, get an opinion uh, from the Harbor Committee, uh, maybe a detailed opinion of any concerns. Um, so it satisfies the board. 
Um, I think. Um, I guess maybe pros and cons. I guess maybe right, some that are like all oh. concerns that that are uh, expressed by your committee. If they chose to give us that, that would be great. Uh, Ryan. Um, any other comments from the board? Otherwise, I would ask um, the applicant to. Um, Ask for a continuance to November 28th. Uh, send a letter to town clerk by postal mail and a copy by email to the planning board clerk, Gail Hunter, requesting that the public hearing be continued through November 28th at 7 p.m. Yeah, is that okay with you? That's our next meeting. Uh, so you need to vote on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take a vote on the, uh, on the request for continuance. Of Crocker's Boat Yard. Uh, of Crocker's Boat Yard. So moved. Second. Roll call, Christina. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Oh, here she is. All right, so now we open the. Just check. Okay, um, this is the same, uh, at this time I'd like to um, open a public hearing on a special permit application for site plan approval for Man for Manchester Marine. Public hearing notice has duly been, been duly noticed and advertised in the cricket as follows in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 48, Section 11, the Manchester by the Sea Planning Board will hold a public hearing on November 9th. 2022 at 7 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting with public participation. We assume to consider the application of Manchester Marine to install and reconfigure floating docks and create a minute configuration zone at the facility located in Manchester Harbor in accordance with section 7.5 and 4.1.10J of the zoning bylaw. It's similar to Crocker's Boatyard proposal that proposes to add slip areas to existing docks to the south of, its, of their facility. Under section 7.8 of the zoning board, the application and plan was sent with request for comments to the Conservation Commission, DPW, Board of Health, Police Chief, Fire Chief, and Selectman. The boards and the departments had 35 days to respond. At this time, we had a response from the Police Chief, CONCOM, and the Harbor Master. The board held a site walk on October 27th. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Susan St. Pierre for the applicant. Okay. And we also have Nicolades here from Manchester Marine. I'm Eric sorry. Nicolades. Okay, welcome. Manchester Marine General Manager and Eric Stevenson representing the owner. Okay, so the Manchester Marine, for I think everyone knows, is right adjacent to the Crocker Boat Yard in Manchester Harbor. So here's the Crocker Boat Yard here existing conditions, and here's Manchester Marine facility. Um, in this case, we don't have a MEPA filing <clears throat> because it's under the threshold for requiring an environmental notification form, but we did have to go before the uh, Manchester Conservation Commission, and we did receive an order of conditions. We also will require a Chapter 91 license <clears throat> to place structures in tidal waters, and we will be required to have an Army Corps permit for placing structures in navigable waters of the United States. So what we're proposing here is currently this, this is the main float, as you might recall from the site visit for those of you who were there. Currently they have linear birthing along that main float. So that linear birthing is going to be replaced with six finger piers. Three of them are 50 feet long and three of them are 30 feet long. So these existing vessels that are birthed here will be accommodated in those finger piers. Then the other part of this project is to reconfigure the easterly docks, and I believe you had this plan in your set. So you can see how the existing uh, float, floating docks are kind of, they're at all different angles and it's not very efficient. So we took this opportunity to do a more efficient layout. And that, that process is going to create uh, three, four additional uh, seasonal slips in this area. Um, the, the, the provision of these finger floats um, is going to create uh, let me see here, um, three new seasonal and three, three new operational slips. 
So they, some of these boats are used for their, some of the uh, linear berthing is used for, for their operations. So the total between the easterly slip and the finger piers is seven new seasonal slips and three new operational slips. So when you add Parker's and this project, we have 27 new seasonal slips. So the Parker's combined. So um, the finger pier comes out from the middle of the building, the, 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 the one closest to town. So it's this one? No, come this, that one. Yeah, yeah. One, that's right in the middle of. So is that the gas dock? No. Uh, the dock is the gas dock's here, right? A little, a little beyond it, coming towards town. Uh, that wouldn't interfere with the use of the gas dock or the pump out. Mm -hmm. no. um, so uh, these finger piers will, will be held in place by uh, six 12-inch diameter steel pipe piles, similar to the Parker's boatyard. And the reconfiguration will include 18 new 12-inch uh, diameter steel stations. Um, similar, I mean, the impacts are similar to what I described for the Crocker Boat yeah, It's an appropriate use for the harbor. They're set back, they're set back from the, this proposed 70-foot channel, which is shown in hash lines on your plans. Varies in this, in this layout from uh, over 70 feet in this location to <coughs> 10 feet in this location. Um, th this uh, results in a parking demand of 3.3 parking spaces. And Manchester Marine has two lots off of Ashland Ave that has adequate parking facility to accommodate three, four parking spaces. Um, the average daily traffic is 24 trips. Um, that includes only 0.7 trips during the AM peak hours and 2.1 during the PM. Um, again, with the facilities taking advantage of the harbor dredging, which is a public infrastructure that the town invested in. Uh, I'd also like to say that, contrary to what was said earlier in the meeting, Manchester Marine did invest its own money in dredging along its facility out here when the town did its dredging. So they piggybacked on that and paid for it with their, with their own money. Um, also, again, it's going to ensure the viability of an important local business in the community. Uh, the existing facility and the proposed expansion would generate $17,000 in harbor use fees. The proposed expansion itself is $3,570 per year in fees. Um, this property is larger than the Crockers and they pay $50,000 in real estate taxes. Um, we have 30 local jobs. And again, the excise tax capital of the town. And this facility also has secondary uh, economic benefit to other businesses in town. Uh, Manchester Marine has a 70 people on its wait list and also is part of the rich maritime history of Manchester. So, again, we're seeking your approval for the special permit. Okay, um, any comments from the board? Similar to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say it's similar to what we just <laughs> went through with Crockers. Um, and I guess the more I hear, I just want, want to voice this, that it's, it, it's hard for seven planning board members to decide something like this without a harbor plan, without really a, um, a town plan. Um, so maybe I'm just struggling with that, but it's hard to, um, you know, since it is... Public waters. It's hard to it's hard to kind of figure out what the, the master harbor plan is for the town. But yeah, I do, I do also want to mention that you know up and down the coast of Massachusetts, there are marinas everywhere, and they all have to be licensed through the state. If they weren't appropriate, they wouldn't be licensed. Yes, sir. Oh, I was going to make a couple points. Um, you know, town character is one of the master plan issues, and I think this cuts both ways on town character. Town character, when you come into Manchester from, you know, some other place, it's a very quaint little harbor, and, you know, and uh, just, it's double counting, by the way, for, say, an excise tax and uh, restaurant revenue, probably, because the people who are paying excise tax presumably live nearby. But anyway, um, so I think that the town character is 
less marina and more harbor. But that said, to service the boats in the harbor, we need uh, robust, healthy boat yards who will be here um, and not, you know, sell to a senior housing or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, no, I, I said that tongue in cheek, tongue in mask. Um, so, so this is this represents a, a, a commitment of these two boat yards to the use that serves this quaint harbor, um, this hurricane hole harbor, sort of. Um, so I think that those are two things that, that I struggle with. The question I have is, you, you have a um, pump out on Manchester Marine stock. Is that yours or is that a tax? Is there a public, I know anybody can use it, but is that paid for with public money or is that a, just yours that, how does um, that work? So we could apply for reimbursement from the state, but we haven't in a number of years. Uh, we just do it because we've been running it at our own expense. And those pump outs are still free to the general public and uh, any of our customers, including the town. Okay. Um, it's just that it's the process to apply for the reimbursement requires you to log all these hours and everything. It's just spending too cumbersome to be yeah. worth our while. So two questions. Is that the only pump out in the in town? Fire? Yeah. That's the only shore side. Um, the other pump out is is the boat. Yeah. Okay. And we do pump out at Manchester Marine. Okay. Um, and I guess the question is, could we um, can make it? Maybe it's a question for Betsy. For either of these proposals, could we make um, hosting a, a pump out uh, in perpetuity a condition of our approval? Because that is a public benefit. Did you say hosting? Uh, conditioning a pump out facility on these piers, either continuing at Manchester Marine in perpetuity or, you know, for 20 years or whatever it is. And maybe the addition of one at Crocker's, I'm just at, it's a question because I'm, I am struggling a little bit with the public benefit. And I do think that the pump out that Manchester Marine has is a public benefit. So I would yeah, want to see that continued, it's going to get squeezed a little bit here with this stock, I think, but, um, so. Well, even the harbor master uses the, the pump out at Manchester Marine to pump out the pump out boat. Mm -hmm. So it so has a public benefit. can't get away that boat either, you know what I mean? Right. Whatever they're doing is good. Thing. Right, I guess my point is there is a public benefit along this pier that is mm -hmm. important to acknowledge. Do you have that's a bigger thing. I mean, it may be that the, we don't need two right next to each other. I'm just yeah, they, thinking they, out loud. Just, just to give it, I think Marblehead has two, and they have 3,000 boats. Yeah. And they have 600 boats in the harbor. Salem yeah. has none. They have a pump up boat. So, yeah, but I do think that the existing pump out at Manchester Marine is a public benefit that's worth acknowledging. Yeah. Thank you. I think we said that in our original. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Gary, you would like to add? Um, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, I applaud both of your businesses. It's really great that you, you're thriving. I hope you're thriving and that you're here. Um, and I have a question for Greg. If we didn't have this bylaw which compels the planning board to review this, which I really feel is not part of our bailiwick. Um, who would be reviewing this? So, <laughs> two different two different processes. So, you, it's, it's before you now as a special as a site plan review process, special term. Um, the harbor but, master receives copies of chapter ninety one licenses. Well, so the separate the chapter ninety one process is separate. And that allows people to comment. So different boards would have that opportunity once they file for the Chapter 91. Chapter 90, you know, DP will announce the application has been received, and they've opened up the comment period. And any any board in town can provide comment regarding, again, the public public benefit for using um, ocean bottom land. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So this is this is unique to Manchester, as I think um, um, Ms. St. Pierre mentioned at the beginning. Uh, most most towns do not have a uh, a separate permitting process for Chapter 91 projects. Well, for whatever it's worth, I think this should be on our list of bylaws that we might want to revise slash eliminate. Um, I really think this is out of our territory, and I would really, I really feel it should be something the selectmen weighs in on because um, they manage the town. This is a, a management and economic issues. There's a lot of issues, but they're not really the kinds of issues that is our um, expertise. That's just my opinion. Right. So that's a separate process, and, and the select board may very well comment to DEP through the Chapter 91 process. Different set of criteria than what you have here before you tonight. Christina. So um, I was on the board a few years ago when you came, and um, I think the scope of that project was a little bit smaller, so I don't think the same questions came up. And I heard phase one, phase two. How many phases are there? Are we at the end, or are we still going? That's my project. Okay. Okay. You're talking to the sorry, sorry. Is the, can I ask that question if it's a different hearing? I think we're on Manchester Marine. What are you trying to ask? I think that's a good question. She's asking, will this, will, is this, is this the beginning of a bigger, the, everything they're going to be doing? Yeah, yeah for now, and then ever. Yes. We, we don't have any additional plans. Also, the, the creation of this 70 foot channel is going to kind of dictate what, it's setting a boundary. Right. It's not really, I mean, it's, as I mentioned at the site visit, there's no really designated channel, but you know, maybe the town could mm -hmm. adopt it somehow. Or other. Could someone speak to, I guess, are we transferring? What What are we deciding to do that you can use this public land in perpetuity for 100 years? Like, what does this decision look like? Can you know, help with that? Or Unfortunately, what, is, so what are we deciding? Well, we're deciding based on the Okay, I didn't ask you. I was asking Betsy or Chris. We're giving a special permit. I understand that. So we're deciding on that criteria. Specific. That's not my question. Mark. So, from my perspective, I can think of a half a dozen communities that um, require the planning board to grant special permits for water related uses. So, this is not unique to Manchester. Um, whether you agree with it or not, or whether, you know, um, so we're is, allowing is. I is um, it's right now it's in your bylaws it's in a number of other communities bylaws um, your role is to take an overview based on what you know of the harbor and what everybody else who's commenting knows of the harbor and whether you think it's germane and appropriate use for this expansion um, whether there's sufficient public benefit knowing it at a local level. Um, and you also need to understand that there's a number of hoops that, you know, um, Ms. St. Pierre has pointed out about um, the other permits that are needed. Um, so I think you have to, you as a board have to look at public benefit. Um, you have to take the advice of the Harbor Committee and the Harbor Master in terms of whether they think it's appropriate, um, and whether it's, uh, I, your master plan has talked about economic stimulus um, and increased commercial operations. Both of these boatyards have been in operation here for a long time. So um, those are all the things that you need to weigh. So I guess specifically, is there a time frame? Are we allowing them to use this public area in perpetuity forever or 100 years or that's my specific question is there a okay. time frame that we could condition um, this permit is that nor I, I don't know I don't think it's normal to condition it for um, a limited period I know there are some special permits that um, communities put a limit on in terms of time frame I think they're making a financial commitment here. So I think to some degree it's pretty unfair to say, oh, you can only do this two years or five Absolutely. years or whatever. Absolutely. But is like a life span right. of the dock? So right. that's right. Can I say the chapter, oh. so the chapter 91 license 
uh, will impose a 30 year term. Okay, that's what uh, Which can be renewed, but the initial license will be a 30 year term. Okay. It used to be, they used to be at a license for. Thank forever. You. Thank you. That's exactly. Right. Uh, you have a comment, Nicole? Yeah, just, just for consideration, I'm not going to speak to um, any of the more technical stuff that's above my pay grade. But you know, if you look at where the slips are, because of our current use, you know, you wouldn't be able to put moorings or anything there. No, absolutely. So it's it would be a decision between you know not allowing us to do it would be a decision that we just don't want anything. Yeah. It's, there's not any, another option. Not a trade-off for more, more improvements. So what is the lifespan of a dock? Um, in terms of before we have to rebuild? Correct. We were getting 30 out of dock before we went to pressure treatment. The hardware wears up before the lumber. So. But it's really the piers are the big you know, piles. piles. Yeah. Yeah, so if there was some... Um, Issue, we needed to correct it. But okay. their, their chapter 91 license yeah. requires, it demands they maintain yeah. Yeah. that pier. Yeah. So they're going to put something in and they're going to maintain it for as long as they can, can get a decent lifespan out of it. And as long as um, the pier is you know, doesn't get, if the pier gets damaged, they have to fix it. It's usually the harbor master, if he sees it, something, a dangerous situation, he can. I'm just saying, if, if the people in 25 years decide that this wasn't a good decision, they can correct it with a 30 year period. I'm just, but my time period was wondering, what are our rights as a community to take back if we ever did need to? That was really my question. Have you ever seen that? Well, sure. wouldn't it be it's a 30-year term to be renewed by the DEP, not to, back to the town? Yeah, I can't, I can't remember, but I assume that there's probably public notice as part of that renewal, so people could come in, can, but I, I'd have to check, but I'm pretty sure there is. If our rules were the same, I would think that they would need to come back again. Sure. Um, I'm looking at our future site plan review pieces, and our current, I have two other issues that if, I think if Laura were here, she would say... Um, given that you're av adding additional cars, could you add um, bike racks? <laughs> this is something to think about. Um, and the other thing that I'm not finding in our new ones, but I says, oh yes, outdoor lighting standards. So in our current bylaw, we have um, uh, lighting somewhere, regulation, uh, um, limited of noise, light, and odor. In our proposed, we have um, the shielding of light fixtures, light trespass, light, light intensity, color efficiency. Um, one question I would have for, it's not really germane to the special permit at hand, and I understand that, but Manchester Marine has a um, high intensity floodlight that you can see from all over at night, all over the downtown. And it's not a best practice to have a um, unshielded light in today's world. I mean, most building codes now would require you have a dark skylight. So I just suggest that perhaps you consider um, upgrading that light to a uh, cutoff light that is um, not doesn't have so much light trespass all, um, from your property. We'll look into that and report back. Notice on. everybody drive drive when you drive out of here, go notice. notice. And it's it is a oh, beacon. You know, no, I'm not saying yeah. you shouldn't light your dogs. Yeah, there are significant anything. security issues, but yes, yeah. we'll look into that. Just the trespass that. light trespass yeah. is the issue. It's it's right not on your dock, so it's on your building. It's probably not um, but yeah, that um Ron Becky Betsy has a question or a comment. Oh, I have a sorry, question. Sorry. So you've added these slips that are coming out toward the channel. Yes. What is where the gas dock and the pump out are? What is the space, the dock space you have, the length of it for, um, for both those elements? So you've got a gas dock there and you've got a pump out. Yes. Uh, it's probably 60 feet. 
I don't have a scale on. Does that sound about right? We have 60 feet set aside, um, you know, kind of designated as a fuel dock, but there's probably more like 80 to 100 feet there that's being sold. But we can only service one boat at a time. So right. we really only need the one space. Okay. Did I ask for any public input? Any public input? Okay, so I think uh, what we'll do is the same thing. We'll look for a, a Harbor Advisory Committee opinion, um, continue to the 28th, if that, uh, if we'll vote that. Um, do the same thing, send a letter and an uh, email. Um, I'll ask the board for a uh, motion to continue the public hearing to November 28th. So moved. At 7 p.m. Yeah. There a second? A second. Uh, roll call, uh, Gary? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Mary? Yes. Can I ask a question? I'm oh, sorry. Six to uh, three. Um, the Harbor Advisory Committee, uh, we're going to try to get that. Uh, okay. I think buy and send their meeting next week. Okay. I think. And I think maybe it maybe you may even want to go to that or listen in. I don't know. Yeah, the country, but maybe. Hey, I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. You remember? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you'll have no to bias. Re you'll, you'll have to recuse yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay. Nice. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. wanted to talk about if we need to meet on uh, yeah. the All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll All right. So uh, Sarah's going to, we're going to, uh, well, so uh, Sarah's going to recuse herself from this. Um, at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing on the special permit application for a site plan approval for the Manchester Department of Parks and Recreation. Public hearing notice has been duly, has been duly noticed and advertised in the cricket in as follows, in accordance with the general law for chapter 40A, section 11, the Manchester by the Sea Planning Board will hold a public hearing on November 9th, 2022 at 7 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting with public participation to resume to consider the application of Manchester Parks and Recreation to construct an athletic field parking lot on Pine Street in accordance with sections 6.9 and 10.3.5.2D of the zoning bylaw. The proposal from Manchester by the Sea Parks and Rec is to construct a youth athletic field with 25 parking spaces on the site of the old burn dump at 156 to 160 Pine Street. The site has been remediated in accordance with Mass DEP standards. The facility will provide much needed relief from Masconoma Park, Sweeney Park, as well as school sports facilities, all which receive a significant amount of use. Under Section 7.8 of the Zoning Bylaw, the application of plan was sent with request for comments from the CONCOM, DPW, Board of Health, Fire Chief, and Selectman. The boards in, had 35 days to respond. At this time, we received response from the Police Chief's Office. No other responses have been received. The board held a site walk on October 27th. And for the applicant um, who is presenting, Nate. Hey, Ron. How you guys doing? Nate, and we have Cher and we have Cheryl Marshall uh, on as well. Cheryl, welcome. You can probably skip right to you, Nate. Yeah. Um, if you can give me control, I can uh, uh, put up some presentation materials. Uh, that would be up to. Um, see, I don't have um, host. Oh, yeah. Host. I can, I can do that. Hold on just a minute. Uh, thank you, Greg. So while we wait a minute for Greg, um, I was just going to start out with for anybody who's not aware of the whole Pine Street project, uh, the way the athletic field project came up is uh, 
you know, the overall town master plan that this board did, the planning board, a lot of hard work between 2016 and 2018. And then that led to um, the, um, the shortage of athletic fields was one of the things that showed up. So then the Parks and Rec Committee did the uh, Parks and Rec Athletic Field Master Plan. And after looking everywhere, um, basically the only space in town um, was this Pine Street area um, that we know used to be the old burn dump. And in many towns and many places, this is a, a great use uh, for that area that has laid dormant for a long time. So now I'll turn it over to Nate. <laughs> So uh, we have enlisted Weston Sampson as the consulting engineer to develop the uh, plans and specifications for this project. Uh, we've gone through a number of public meetings uh, for the project, solicited uh, feedback from the community, from a lot of the direct abutters. Um, we've gone through CONCOM, um, you know, as it is the existing burn dump, you know, there was definitely some concerns uh, in that regard. Uh, the site has an AUL, which is an activity and use limitation, which basically stipulates uh, what can and cannot be done on the site, and that's issued by DEP. Uh, athletic fields is uh, one of the approved uses for the site. Uh, CONCOM, uh, we have direct uh, wetlands that are on the site, uh, so that is kind of one of the main things that limited the size of the field and what we were uh, working, I, I shouldn't say against, but you know, that's basically, you know, we went as far as we could. We made the field as big as possible without going into the 30 foot no build zone uh, or no disturb zone. Um, so as you can see on the screen, this is kind of a, a general uh, layout of the field and the parking lot. Um, mostly gonna be used for U10, uh, I believe. Is that is that what we're saying? Cheryl, uh, yeah. you know, so mostly smaller kids as a practice uh, to take really away the burden from some of the other fields like Masco um, that are getting heavily used and also in preparation for the next Sweeney uh, field upgrade that we are currently under design for as well. Because uh, once that goes into construction, we're gonna lose that for likely a couple uh, seasons, uh, you know, playing seasons. So we're gonna need to supplement with fields elsewhere. Um, Here's a profile of the overall field. Um, so showing kind of the, the drainage, uh, you know, we have a general 2% slope on the field going to either side. On either side, uh, we have the wetland buffers. And from basically from the wetland buffer up to the field is a three to one slope, which was allowed us to maximize the field. Uh, on the slopes, we we're gonna be planting with a pollinator mix, um, you know, as approved by CONCOM. Here are some uh, kind of screenshots uh, or some photos of the existing site as it is now. Uh, mostly just vegetation that DPW mows, uh, I believe, once a year uh, to, to make sure there's nothing growing into the existing liner. Uh, this is the current plan set um, as we went through at the site walk. Um, I'll go to the parking lot and materials plan here. Um, this is a good one. So as I said, we have 25 parking spots, uh, which is uh, including an ADA accessible spot, which will allow anyone to get up onto the field that is located right here. Uh, one comment that uh, Ms. Tenney made during the site walk was to revise the uh, walkway up to the field. We initially had it kind of hugging the parking lot and it exceeded the 5% grade that uh, would require a handrail. Um, it was still under the 10%, you know, for ADA, but it did require a handrail. We modified it to do more of a serpentine uh, route up, which kept it below the 5%, which does not require a handrail. Um, we added some plantings, some uh, small uh, shrubs in this area to also kind of help fill it in and make sure, you know, kids aren't cutting through uh, this area right here or, or anyone cutting through there kind of trampling it over time uh, we also have one tree located right here i believe that's a red maple um, 
This is the current uh, plant list right here. So it's a mix of red maples. We have some green giant arborvitaes along the back, uh, some white pine and some pin oak. And then the shrubs are the are common witch hazel. And the arrowwood verburnum. Uh, and so you can see these, uh, the green giant arborvitae and the uh, uh, white pines are all along the back here to provide screening for one of the direct abutters. Um, Cheryl and I met with him um, on two occasions and you know, this was really to help alleviate the, the sight lines from his residence right down onto the field and help to provide some uh, screening for him, you know, as these uh, uh, plantings grow. And we also, you know, looking at these to meet the uh, one tree per five parking spot requirement that is in the bylaw. Or, um, so the other aspect is that, uh, so this is going to be a paved parking lot. Uh, all the drainage is going to go to two catch basins that are located on uh, the uh, entrance to the uh, parking lot on each side. Those will tie into an existing catch basin um, that we are going to renew and slightly shift to accommodate this walkway. And that ties into the existing uh, stormwater system that is in Pine Street. A little better shown right here. So any runoff that's coming from the parking lot is not going into, so this is all granite curb surrounding the parking lot. Uh, and that's all gonna be captured and go down to these two catch basins and then out. Um, I think the other kind of major thing that we've been talking about, and you know, we certainly heard throughout the, the public meetings uh, was pedestrian access. And you know, how do we make sure the uh, site is accessible for our kids to walk to and you know, be confident that you know we they can have access. Um, so we had discussed that, and uh, part of our plan um, was to to make this sidewalk. Oops, am I sharing the wrong screen here? There we go. Uh, we are gonna. Uh, this current sidewalk ends just at Moses uh, Moses Hill. So our plan is to extend the sidewalk, uh, asphalt sidewalk with granite curbs down to the opposite end of Moses Hill and then do a crosswalk uh, basically which ties into where the uh, new serpentine path will lead up. Um, I had our, uh, our DPW's on-call traffic engineer review this plan. Uh, we looked at site distances uh, for approaching from both sides of the road and then site distances uh, sight line distances uh, from exiting the parking lot. Um, their review uh, noted that if we assume, uh, and I should know, it's a 25, it's posted 25 miles an hour. And, you know, one of the main comments from residents was that, you know, that is not the speed cars generally travel. Um, so we assumed that, uh, when we reviewed the sight lines, when our engineer reviewed the sight lines, she assumed that it was a uh, 85th percentile uh, 30 for 35 miles an hour, which would require a stopping distance of 250 feet. Um, if you assumed it went up to 40 miles an hour, that increases to 305 feet. Um, so when she looked at it, um, she noted that there, were, there are no um, sight line issues coming outbound. Um, but she did note that there's one minor sight line issue on the inbound side um, before you get to uh, the existing entrance uh, due to kind of some foliage and shrubs that have grown into the kind of sight line right through here. Um, so one item she said that could address that is the addition of the uh, activated pedestrian signs. So as we were already planning to include those, you know, we'd have basically re met that requirement. Uh, one deviation she did recommend, um, you know, from this plan that as I have laid out on the screen is just moving the uh, pedestrian crossing sign ahead back a bit further into the 250 to 300 foot range. So I have them 
you know, a bit closer than that. You know, so this outbound one would more likely move, uh, you know, to the very entrance of uh, or slightly before uh, the Moses Hill. And then on the opposite side, it would go further out towards 128. Um, another op item that she said we could include is uh, yield arrows or, or shark teeth, as they're sometimes called. Um, and that, uh, you know, provides another visual, uh, you know, warning that there is crossing coming up, um, you know, from any, any way you're coming um, inboard, inbound or outbound, you'll very clearly see the activated flashing signs, um, you know, from any distance from the inbound side, you can see them basically from Rockwood Heights, you know, which is or the, uh, the state DPW yard. And on the uh, outbound side, you can see it uh, well before you get to uh, Moses Hill. Um, I think that uh, pretty much covers, you know, everything that we've talked about on the site walks and, you know, major concerns that, you know, we heard from residents and uh, throughout the course of the project. So can open up to uh, questions and comments. Yeah, Nate, it's Ron. Um, the sidewalk, is that Bitcock sidewalk you're proposing on the... Uh... Correct, yes. Asphalt sidewalk with granite, vertical granite curb. Will there be a curb? Okay, so there'll be a curb. So um, there's some protection. Yes. Okay, and what about uh, removing some of that brush uh, on that site distance? Uh, in, you know, in in addition to the signage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, we can certainly trim the DPW. Can certainly trim that trim that back as you know, just that as a housekeeping item. All right, um, any questions from the board, Chris only? Uh, Nate, is there lighting, any kind of lighting in this parking area? Uh, there's gonna be no part uh, lighting proposed for the field at all. Uh, basically due to the uh, kind of myriad of issues, the, you know, all the abutters um, were certainly not in favor of lighting. And then uh, with the, uh, being the old bird up, we could only go down 12 inches, so there's no way to do a foundation, you know, the foundation necessary for any type of field lighting. Okay. And uh, how did you determine the number of parking spaces? Uh, basically, we maximized what we could get on the site. It was kind of a compromise between, uh, you know, filling out the field size, kind of building in, as I noted before, the kind of working from the buffer zones uh, with three to one slopes up to field level uh, and then kind of making that rectangle and then working, you know, as it's not a perfectly square site, you know, kind of working with a bunch of different configurations to try to figure out, you know, how many, how we can maximize parking. There's overflow parking too across the street, I think. Is there overflow parking? No, or there's going to be no overflow parking. I think we are thinking that if the there is a need, uh, we would look to the shoulder of Pine Street where there is quite a bit of shoulder um, to accommodate that. What about where we parked for the site? What, what was that? That's just that's just it, going to Moses Hill. Yeah, that's Moses Hill. Uh, the residents, I think, would be very weary of that. Um, they did express concern about that during the public meeting. So I, I, I don't think, uh, kind of akin to uh, forestry and the pickleball court, I think we want to stay away uh, from from parking there. Mary? So I guess along the parking question, um, is there a industry standard for fields um, based on the size of the field, so you know there's going to be X amount of kids playing. You know, I understand the space is confined, so that's how you did parking, but are we trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, and, and are we accommodating enough parking? It is a, a little bit also based on industry standard of that size field. Um, so it's assuming like two teams of 12 um, at 25 spots, which we know that's never exactly right. Um, but um, yes, at one point 
when the architects, the uh, engineers were working on it, they did mention a smaller parking lot. And at that point, I said to them, you know, forget the whole project. If we don't have at least 25 spots, then we don't have a field, as far as I was concerned. And uh, that's when the field had to shrink a little to make sure we did have at least 25 spots. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned the runoff from the parking lot. Where is the runoff going in the back that goes towards neighbors and then... Um, so there's one side that has a neighbor there, I think, and then in the back, and then there's the wetlands on my head. Um, but yeah, so it, is there any is there any plan for runoff, or is it just because it's so no? It should all here. infiltrate, you know, as it does now. It's, it's going to be a grass field, um, you know. So we are we are specifying uh, a bit of a sandier soil mix um, that should help stimulate growth for the field. Um, but also help with that drainage to make sure it does infiltrate and we're not pooling up there. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the previous slides, it, you know, we do have a slight uh, slope on the field to, to help promote that, you know, so you're not getting standing water, but everything should infiltrate, um, you know, as it does now. And especially on, you know, the, the two to one slopes where this is going to be, you know, pollinator mix, long, tall flowers, wild flowers. Um, you know, so that's really going to help absorb everything, and then you're into the um, wetlands here already, basically to the corners of the project here. And then just um, another quick question, is the expanded sidewalk part of this project cost, or is that a separate cost? So it's not going to be bid with this project. Uh, the DPW has an on-call paving contract where we, you know, basically get more commodity pricing. Um, you know, so we're we'll be doing you know quite a bit of sidewalk work and paving next spring. Um, so it only makes sense to really include this pay this sidewalk work with that work where we'll get better pricing. Um, but the cost of it will come from you know what's been allocated for the field. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, because I think at the beginning you said it wasn't part of the project cost. So, correct. It's 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 not part of the bid project. So the contractor that does correct. the work yep. on the field will not construct the sidewalk. However, the funds that pay for the sidewalk are coming from the funding for the field. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Gary or Christina, any questions, Christina? I do. So um, you said that you had correspondence with um, your parking engineer and your traffic engineer for sight lines. Um, is there a formal report? Can we be given a copy of that? No formal report at this at this time. Um, it was more of a de desktop exercise to look at it. Um, we could certainly put something together, uh, but their opinion was that uh, you know just based upon what, what is already proposed. You know, if you didn't meet those sight line distances, you know, we are doing what that would be already, essentially. We're already with the belt and suspenders, uh, with the activated beacons uh, and, and additional signage. Uh, I guess that was really my only concern when I visited the site. I mean, I, as a grown adult, was pretty nervous crossing that street, so I can't imagine a 10-year-old riding a bike. Um, being as diligent as maybe I am. So I guess as the activated beacons, I know I have one on the corner of my proper, or the corner of my street, and it honestly rarely works. Um, but one that I do like is on like what 62, that big bike trail downtown Danvers. Yeah. Um, that one is really in your face. And as much as I do not like these activated beacons, I really am adamant that this one really needs to be in your face. I'm really concerned about children crossing the street. Um, I haven't seen anything that you've proposed and the last time that these were coming up around town, I thought that maybe the planning board should have had a little bit of input on that just to make sure our character, whatever that means, um, is consistent. Um, so do you have something in mind? Uh, not specifically that I can share right now. I, okay. I think we were thinking using the same one that as it that is at Lincoln Street. Right. Um, you know that style. We can certainly go to 
Uh, I'm not familiar with the one on, on Route 62, um, but I could certainly uh, no, it see what. It's not 97. There might be one on 97, but there's definitely one downtown Danvers that is very effective. Yeah, we, we can certainly, you know, it, you know, it's open right now of how we can spec it. Um, so it, you know, I can take a look at that one. And if that's, you know, what the planning board would like to put there, that that's certainly something that we can do. Thanks. Yeah, I have a couple things. Um, what's the width of Pine Street there compared to the minimum width that we have to um, maintain? Uh, I'm not, uh, give me two seconds. I don't know that off the top of my head, the actual width, but if I can uh, measure quickly. Because I'm talking about traffic slowing measures. I've often thought instead of just throwing speed limits on that street, we, if we had just painted the lines closer together and made it a more narrow street, that already slows down traffic. The width of that street is so wide, it encourages higher speeds. You talking about the fog lines? What do you call them? Fog lines. Oh, yeah, yeah, doing narrowing the lanes. You know, we have implemented that in other areas of town. I think it's hard in this location, just kind of giving me, given the kind of narrow section of it is of it. Um, you're the, you know, the limited area compared to the overall width of, of or the overall length of Pine Street. You know, it'd be a much larger project to to go back and, and reline um, you know that large of an area of Pine Street. Okay, well it, it does sound like it, there's some impracticalities there, but it could be part of what could be considered. Um, what about um, what about school bus pulling off? Are you accommodating or anticipating one or even two school buses to pull over under the shoulder of the, I assume it's, it's not paved there, right? Of the sidewalk area? We're, we're not expecting school buses to use this field anyways. Ever? Well, it won't be for high school level sports. So, no. Is it a practice field? field? I know it's not a standard field. Um, maybe the parks. Uh, I'm not sure who just spoke. I can't even see. Sorry, that was Cheryl Marshall. Oh, okay. You don't anticipate there ever being a school bus to bring kids there? I do not. Okay. Um, all right. So it looks like we have 12 foot lane widths there with. Uh, Three foot shoulder on the outbound side and two foot shoulder on the inbound side. What's so the, call it thirty feet overall total road width. What's the minimum? Just so I know. Uh, Eleven feet. Okay, so there will be probably informal overflow parking on the sidewalk zone and there on the shoulder of the road. On the inbound side. The other side of the sidewalk. On the outbound. With a curb. With a curb. That's what he said. So no park. Only on the inbound side, I would think. Yeah. yeah Correct. Yeah. And like that's only got a two foot shoulder. He's saying so. Paved shoulder. There's there's more area that's uh -huh. you know kind of gravel off the off the shoulder kind of before you get to the actual tree line there. So you could park there. I mean, I just think realistically we should anticipate that and accommodate as much as can. We know a lot of people are not going to want to go into a dead end parking lot. To, to try to drop off their kids. A lot of people are going to cruise by, drop, and go. It's just reality. And it can be accommodated, but if there's anything we can do to accommodate better, we should scrutinize it. We'll definitely be reaching out to the leagues that permit the fields um, to discourage that. Um, but as a drop and go, it's going to that happen. may happen, but yeah. they probably won't be parking there. And we'll discourage that with the leagues. Yeah, maybe a sign, you know, drop off. Well, no parking. I don't know. It's just well, something it's to consider in a special permit hearing. You might have a sign saying drop off only. You might not. You might want to just simply say no parking to not even encourage dropping off. You know, they're gonna drop off and go. That's just how it's gonna function. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying 
Yeah. If there's signage we want to take into account or any um, changes to that shoulder in terms of materials. Yeah, if there was drop off, it would probably be where we parked for that site visit, I would think, and then walk across the street. Mm -hmm. That's an awesome point. But even then, yeah, it's when, kind we of were, a, when we were at that site visit, I mean, people did not go less than 40 miles an hour. It was pretty quick, line. it was a little and scary. So I kind of equate it to um, Sweeney, right, on Summer Street. And people don't go that fast on that section of Summer Street because it's, I don't know why, but. Um, it's close to town. It's, it's closer. Also close to town. So I don't think you, at Sweeney you have that same issue of driving, dropping on the street and going. You definitely pull into Sweeney, drop off, and go. Well, the other thing is that people are going to the fields are becoming outbound, not inbound. So they would have to turn around, which they're not going to want to do. So I, my guess is they are going to pull into the parking lot. They're going to pull turn around in Moses exactly. Hill and drop their kid right. off. And then yeah. and That's the, what the, I kid, the people at Moses Hill are going to start Right. Come in through on. that little piece and then go home. Yeah. So, isn't there beyond Moses Hill? Isn't there a small street there? Yeah, there's another street that and goes. And so, off. what's the likelihood of people parking there? That's a good point. Um, it is. It's like a small private road. I think it's a private. Well, road. It's it's public. Public. I don't know if it's pri yeah. private or public, but. Public road. Um, so, Nate, beyond Moses Hill, on the same side as Moses Hill. There's a street beyond it. Yep. What's the likelihood of A, people parking there for overflow parking, and B, swooping into Moses Hill if they're coming outbound and just doing the loop at Moses Hill, dropping their kid off, and then turning around and going back inbound? It well, actually has a loop. Uh, that road is a loop. Yeah, I, I think similar to Moses Hill, we would certainly part, uh, post no parking signs, you know, for the field on Harrington Way um, to eliminate that. It's Harrington. Harrington, yeah, Harrington Way. Um, I, I don't know what we could do to do to prevent, um, you know, pulling into Moses Hill and you know stopping people from do that. Um, you know, you do see people do that already. Um, to reverse direction, um, you know, this would certainly be more of it, you know, potentially. Um, but yeah, outside of signage, I'm not sure what you could do to to eliminate that. Um. Yeah, I mean, signs are only going to go so far. I think I, I, it's it's a tricky spot. Is 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 my concern with the, the speed that people go? Um, is there any? I'm sorry. Is there any calming measures that you could put before the crosswalk? I don't think we would want to put any sort of like. Uh, speed bump or speed table um, or anything to that effect because I think it'll be an, an auditory disturbance, you know, for a majority, you know, full time for the residents that are there and especially for, you know, the, the portion of the year that the field is not in use. Um, and then it's also going to be a plowing issue uh, during. So if it's I'm not necessarily a speed bump, but some kind of something different kind of pavement, rumble, I guess the rumble strip would make noise, right? Um, yeah. So we could do the, you know, the, the what I mentioned earlier, um, the yield triangles, or you know, they sometimes called like they look like shark teeth, um, you know, that are another kind of visual. It's you know just painted triangles on oh, the uh, on the ground. Um, could you bulge the fog lines a little bit, Nate, so that it just tightens up just when you get to the fog line? Sorry, I didn't I didn't catch that, Chris. Can you, can you uh, bulge? In the clog line, so you make a narrower set of lanes just at the crosswalk. Not all the way. I, I think that would be hard, given the. So it is a 12-foot lane now. I think we could only go down to an 11, and I think that would be very awkward for that one kind of section of of the road. I, I don't see it reducing speeds, you know, that significantly, if at all. Okay. 
I have one last thing, and it's just since they are 10 year olds, one idea was some kind of protection if there was a storm and parents needed to come. I know we're not, parents aren't far, but is there, I know you can't dig down, but maybe just some kind of like seasonal, like those. Tent. Yeah. Like a bus stop thing. Or maybe a bus stop thing, but more like a tent. So rain, lightning, sun, like those, they almost look like sails, but they're like pegged in the ground somehow. But if you can't go down, I'm not sure if that's reasonable. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, that that would be definitely the issue is we couldn't do any sort of foundation uh, to, to for that. I think it would have to be more of a freestanding structure. Um, we don't have currently anything in the plans for that, but... I don't know if that's, uh, you know, we could look into something like that, um, or I don't know if Cheryl had, has used other things like that elsewhere. I have not, no. The first time it's come up, but we can look into that for sure. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, any comments from the public? I don't see any hands up. Um, same thing here. I think we'll uh, continue. Um, do we need any uh, further information from the DPW? I mean, I would like to see those reports. Yeah. Nate, if you can get the reports. Uh, Which reports? Definitely traffic. And then the other one was parking. Sight lines and parking. Were those memorialized, or were they just? I I did no. Know. Well, Nate, you sorry, sent sorry me, go. you sent me an email late today on site distances. Yep. So that can be included. Um, trying to think of what else. Um, so maybe if you provided a little more information, I mean that's going to be a standard pedestrian light. Um, yeah, if you could find out a, a more of a, a more a larger beacon for the pedestrian crossing, as okay. described, if you could maybe take a ride up there, or uh, I don't know where this one's located, but maybe you could do it by Google Earth. I don't know. I'm sure we can get that info. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the sight lines was just a, desk, a desktop exercise. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't a, they did not issue a memo memo or anything along those lines. And, and same for the parking. It was, it was really looked at within the scope of this project for the parking. Uh, they didn't do any, you know, analysis of, of the parking. So I guess if this was not a town project, we would ask maybe for peer review. So I guess for us to rely on that, maybe we can memorialize that. I mean, we're relying. How about if we ask for the, how many parking spaces are in Escanoma Park? I just really would like to know what the industry standard is versus what we're approving. Like, I mean, we're just kind of going with what she already stated what the industry standard is. Probably do it by a flyover. Cheryl, I thought Cheryl very clearly specifically stated the industry standard, stated that they made the parking lot to comply with. No, I don't think no, she did say that at all. Did, did, did. Okay, I, I can get a chart. Thank you. Yeah. The chart is she did not. She said she only wanted, if it was going to be 25 spaces. She did not say that. It's going to be like five spaces. I'm not sure the Masconoma Park comparison is a fair comparison because you've got a lot of boaters using that. Well, and playground. Sure, but if it's adequate for the for the playing fields, right? Maybe Sweeney. Sweeney There's might no, be better. Well, why not, park neither park of those parks are ever. Sweeney definitely doesn't have parking. Nice hard parking there. Cheryl, I'm not judging. I just wanted something to say. This is what we looked at. We analyzed it. You did the best that you could with the site, just so our file is complete. Yep, the engineers do that, but I'll I'll, I'll see what I can get. Specific. But usually we would get some kind of a report from them. Yeah. Huh? Right Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just so what we said that we relied on something. 
So do we want to have a motion to continue this? Yes. Um, I'd like to have a motion to continue the public hearing to November 28th, which I'm scheduling now three again uh, on the same day. Hopefully uh, we'll have the time. At 7 p.m. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, uh, Christina? Yes. Ms. Foley? Yes. Ms. Soli? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Okay, uh, six zero. Laura should be back. She can comment on the trees. <laughs> um, okay, same deal, uh, you know, uh, town clerk, uh, postal mail, uh, requesting an extension and um, an email to Gail Hunter requesting the extension. This isn't an extension, it's a continuance. Uh, the continuance. So they shouldn't have to ask for anything. Mm. For continuance, this board has continued it to a uh, time and date certain. Well, then that's that's different than what our former uh, what our former secretary told us to do. Oh, I'll bring you Mass General off for the next meeting. Send it to <laughs> Helene. <laughs> Ron, what we used to do was to ask the applicant for their permission to continue it, so that we were not so that extended the time frame we had to make a decision. And we used to have them sign a little form saying they they, extend, they give permission. It has something to do with the clock, I think. Yeah. Well, you have ninety days to hold a public hearing on. You're allowed ninety days from the opening of the public hearing. To make a decision. Yeah. So okay. you're well within your time frame. Okay. But we used to do that just in case we went further, just to give us more than ninety days. If the applicant agrees, we used to just get. No, them. no, no. I totally understand that, and. I would not want a constructive grant based right. on the time frame, but you're well within your time frame. Yeah, and we'll be able to get this done within our time frame, most likely. Okay. That's just how we used to do it. Yeah. The continuance has been agreed to. Okay, so Eric can come back. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all. Thank you. Nate, it was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great reuse of the site, too. The graphics were clear. It'd be better as a DPW site, but you can't dig more than 12 inches. Oh, okay. okay, last thing I have is approval of minutes 912 and 926. Has anybody read them? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Ms. Foley. So, on the October 24. Is that what we're doing? I'm sorry. What are we doing? Uh, well, Gail, um, is she on? It is 1024. Okay. It is 912 and 1024. Okay, so it might, the, uh, it's top of my pile with 1024. Can I do that? Yes. Um, the first page, the last sentence, it says, um, garage parking will come in phase two with the addition of 200 to 300 square feet over multiple years. I think that's 2,000 to 3,000 square feet. Um, that was it. Minutes in there? What was it? That was Motion to accept the minutes of 1024 okay. as amended. That was even more than that. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Yes. 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 Is there enough? I didn't read. Yes, I guess yes. Yes. Four zero. Yeah. It's enough. Oh, Sarah. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was 200,000 square feet. That's what I was going to say. It seems way more than that. Thank you, Sarah. It's, not too, it's, tw it's 200 and 300,000 square 300, feet. 300,000. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like that's, <laughs> I was going to say 20,000. I'm like, I don't think that was enough. No. Exactly. It was the thousand in phase one and was not two hundred after that. That's what Mary said. Two hundred to three hundred. Right? Yeah. That's, oh it. My That's God. what we voted on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, just to give you a sense, the high school is one hundred sixty thousand. But anyway, um, so right. with so that, we'll, we'll amend it to that. those numbers. So it was correct. Thank you. Two hundred to three hundred. Hundred thousand. Yeah. We just you just yeah, you had two hundred to three hundred square feet. And it's two hundred to three hundred thousand. I thought I had a K there, sorry. 
Okay, and no, nine. Ascent, yes. Okay, and nine twelve, Ms. Foley. Um, the only thing I had on that is page one, two, three, middle of the page. It says Mr. Delicio should be Ms. Delicio. Oh. Yeah, my husband wasn't here at that meeting. <laughs> Okay, uh, is that all you have for that? I think that's all I have. Anyone else okay. have any changes? No. Okay, uh, motion to approve the minutes of 912 as amended. Mr. Olney? Second? I second. Roll call, Ms. Delisio? Yes. Ms. Foley? Yes. And then, yes, 4-0. Yes, I vote yes. Yeah. Oh, and Sarah's. Right, 5-0, sorry. Other matters uh, not reasonably anticipated. Anything, Sarah, more on this? Anybody have anything? I would just like to mention one thing. Um, these all the three hearings tonight, we have an application folder. So I'm like going back and I can't even remember where we started these. Like, can we start to get these in the right application folders? That makes sense. Can we make an application folder on we SharePoint? We have one. Oh, we have one. Can we move those in there, uh, Gail or Becky or uh, somebody? Of course, we can move them in as soon as I. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of moving, Gail. Really. I have too many. I have like a setting on, and I'm not trying to figure out how to set it off. But I'm like, Gail, you're doing a lot of moving and changing. I'm like, oh, my inbox. I haven't cool. moved and changed anything really. I, don't I can know. barely move anything. I I don't know. I must have a hundred emails, Gail Hunters. Change this. I don't know. All minutes. I had a question. Um, did we ever get a, um, I think Sarah and Chris were going to meet with um, Mr. Bobrowski. Did we ever get what that meeting was? We did meet with him today, actually. And we just went over the rules. He's going to uh, answer questions. Uh, limit of two minutes for anyone to speak. Just wanted to make sure he understood all those ground rules. Did he review the bylaws since he hadn't seen yes, them? In he was gonna, yes, and he's going to review them again. Before we, so he didn't have any comments about? No. Okay. We had also informed him of town council's uh, opinion about the civil majority for the ABU um, bylaw. For all he of them, right? He didn't disagree. Yeah. It says... Wait, it's a two-thirds vote the, for all the bylaws. Correct. Right. Right. Correct. The, the, the failure for the ADU to meet the requirements for civil majority. Right. As with all of them, right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, I'll take a motion. Just, uh, just a note, we may need a special town meeting uh, before. I'll send an email if there's a, some kind of an emergency that we need to. Otherwise, we'll see you all at town meeting on Monday. Um, Ron, on that question, I think if we're going to meet, we should have our posting for the high school, and we should uh, the hot posting should say we're not going to have a, a Zoom component. I'll, I'll put an agenda on to that effect. You're meeting in the community room. Yeah, we're the community okay. room, which is where it's off the cafeteria, right off the. Okay. I, I sent you directions. Okay, I will, no, no, I will no. send out the directions again. No, no, no I'll find them. <laughs> okay. Do we sit on the stage? Yes, we're sitting, we're sitting up front. That's definite. Yeah. I think it's definite because it's in the high school auditorium, is what I is my guess. So that's what Alan has. The planning board will all sit together at a table, is what his plan is. I, I haven't. We should probably be there by six. When does it start? Ron, Ann, Ann Harrison has her hand up. Ann Harrison. Um, when, when Alan spoke to the select board uh, about the, the arrangement, um, the, he will be at the center of the stage. Um, the select the Greg and the town clerk will be to his immediate right, and the um, select board will be further to his right, and the planning board will be to his left. And there will be a podium at um, the left end um, for those who who want to speak and and don't want to speak from their position at, on the stage. 
At least that's my recollection. And, we and thank you for recognizing it. What? We have to wear masks. Even when we're speaking? No, not when we're speaking, but when we're there. Otherwise, you're that's, in yes. the cafeteria. They, wear, they don't wear masks in football games. Or okay. when they're in the adjourning? auditorium. <laughs> I second the motion to adjourn. Okay, yes. motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you for a tremendous amount of work.